Praise the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Would you join me in praising the Lord right now? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for your blessings, Lord. Praise your wonderful name. Praise your wonderful name. Through all eternity, Lord, we'll praise your wonderful name. The name above all names, Lord. The name that redeemed us. The name of Jesus. Hallelujah to you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for waking us up this morning. Thank you, Lord, for being our sufficiency. Thank you, Lord, that all that we need has been provided through your atonement, Lord Jesus. Oh, praise your name, Lord. We pray for all those that are watching this morning, Lord. We ask, Lord, that they would feel your presence wherever they are, your presence surrounding them, Lord, your presence comforting them, your presence encouraging them, lifting them up, Lord. We pray, Lord Jesus, in the mighty name that is above all names, Lord, that you would touch all those who are suffering today, Lord, with any kind of sickness or any kind of infirmity. And Lord, that you would touch those, Lord Jesus, that are battling COVID right now, that you would give them extra special strength and grace for this hour. We pray also for the president and for the first lady, Lord, that you would touch them too, Lord Jesus. Let them, Lord, be a testimony and a witness to the entire world, Lord, of the saving power of Jesus Christ that delivers above all. Lord, we thank you for this day. Thank you for the, the, the renewing of this day. Lord, may we, Lord Jesus, be renewed in our spirit, re refired in our spirits today. In Jesus' name, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. Would you say that out loud with me? Say, in Jesus' name, hallelujah. Wherever you are, just say, in Jesus' name, praise God, praise God. Hallelujah. We're going to be taking communion this morning, so if you have the ability to get something, and, you know, it, it really doesn't matter. You know, some people might get into a, a theological argument about the elements have to be this or that or the other, but I think anything that you have, a cracker, a piece of bread, even water, anything that you have available, you can take this morning with us to remember our Lord's sacrifice. This is Pastor's Appreciation Month, so we want to encourage all pastors, pastors uh, and their wives, pastors and their husbands, we want to encourage all pastors that God uh, would honor you and bless you for the work that you do in the kingdom, for, for accepting the call of the kingdom. This is also the birthday month of our founder, Sister Amy McPherson. And so we praise God for her ministry and for her continued uh, influence on all of us. And we remember her and her birthday. It's also the birthday of our church, which began 64 years ago this month. And so we thank God for Sister Georgia Bird, who had the call of God and the vision to come to Millingsville, Georgia, a place on the map, <laughs> and begin the work here. Normally on Wednesday nights, we uh, have Pastor Connects, where we try to connect with each other and just uh, catch up on our week. You know, uh, people say or use the phrase, the new normal. We don't even know what the new normal is. But one of the things that I know that we need to do is just continue to stay connected. And even if it's uh, only being connected by uh, a, a howdy on the internet, do that. If it's being connected by a phone call, do that. Stay connected, no matter how hard it is. You know, I pick up my groceries every week at Walmart, and uh, for the last few weeks, it's been the same person. And now this person, when they come to my car, they say, How you doing, Mr. Terry? 
And I think to myself, you know, this person is blessing me by serving me and by putting my food in my car. And now we've connected in a small way. So much so that he now says to me, Hello, Mr. Terry. Hope you're having a good week. And I pray for him. I pray for him too, for all those that are continued to serve and help us as we go through this trying time. So on Wednesday night, we will not have our normal Pastor Connects, but it will begin at 7. And there'll be a link on the webpage for you to go to and for you to join with. And we'll be listening to a message from the president of the Foursquare Church. Randy is the new president, and this will be the first official, I guess, uh, connection for all of us to connect with our president and to listen to a timely word from him and from the Lord. So join us at 7 p.m. Wednesday night. A little bit earlier, but that's because the entire world is going to be joining this. Four square churches around the world will join, and so they picked a time that is optimal for everyone, if there is such a thing, you know? <laughs> What's optimal? Well, we come this morning to the, third, uh, to, to the fourth chapter of 1 Corinthians, and this is an interesting chapter. We covered a little bit of it last week. Sometimes when we read through the Bible, the Bible is just words. We read through these words and we don't connect with them and we don't understand them. So this morning I would like to help you a little bit in, in understanding what Paul meant when he wrote these words. He wrote them to a church that he had established himself. They were his spiritual children. But now they had become kind of puffed up and prideful about who they were and their supposed importance in the world. You know, when I first became, well, not when I first became, when I was a child, I remember the Pentecostal churches. We were in the kind of like the poor section of town. We were on the other side of town, across the railroad tracks, Maybe we met in a small storefront building. Everybody in the community looked at us and said, oh, that's just those crazy Pentecostals over there. And now the Pentecostal church has mega churches. And some of the Pentecostal churches don't even use the word Pentecost anymore. Now they want to call themselves non-denominational. It's easy for the church people to be blessed of God and to receive that blessing. But sometimes it's difficult for us to not become prideful and to begin to puff ourselves up. And so the Apostle Paul wrote this book to the Corinthians who had now begun to puff themselves up. So let's read beginning in the 8th verse of the 4th chapter of 1 Corinthians. And keep in mind that this is all sarcasm. Paul is being sarcastic to try and prove a point to them. I'm going to be reading it in a different translation, but I hope you can follow along. He said, you're already full. You're already rich. You have reigned as kings without us. And indeed, I could wish you did reign, that we also might reign with you. For I think that God has dis, uh, displayed us, the apostles, last, as men condemned to death. For we have been made a spectacle to the world, and both to angels and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are distinguished, but we are dishonored. To the present hour we both hunger and thirst and are poorly, uh, poorly clothed and beaten and homeless. And we labor, working with our own hands. 
being reviled, we bless, being persecuted, we endure, being defamed, we entreat. We have been made as the filth of the world, the offscouring of all things until now. It is, as I said a minute ago, it's a part of the church as, as we are challenged when we are blessed to be careful that we don't begin to think of ourselves so special, so high and mighty. Even if we're blessed in our personal lives, we have to be careful that we don't think that somehow we earned this. Paul says, you're living like rich men while we are being persecuted without anything. He's trying to exp express to them the importance of being careful and not being prideful. Although he uses strong sarcasm, his purpose isn't to make fun of them. He wants to shake the Corinthians out of their pride, out of their self-willed thinking. He was laughing at them with a holy laughter, and yet with utter contempt for what they had been doing. The image of the Corinthians here is either from the Colosseum or the Parade of the Conquering. When Paul says that they were displayed, meaning that the apostles have been set up for everyone to see. If you become a Christian, this is what will happen to you. How many people will become Christians? How many people will accept Christ if they are told it's not going to be a perfect life? You're not going to get riches. In fact, you're going to be beaten. You're going to be imprisoned. You're going to be persecuted. You're going to be tormented. You're going to be hungry. You're going to be without clothes. You're going to be homeless. How many people would jump on and say, I want to be a Christian? But you see, the Corinthians, that wasn't something that they were having. They were now a, a seasoned church. They'd been around a while, and so now, you know, they were all starting to wear suits. They were all starting to drive fancy cars and live in expensive homes and begin to think that, oh my goodness, look at how special we are. And Paul contrasts their life with his. He said, look at us. We have nothing. And yet, what is our response? Our response is to remain Christ-like. Our response is to thank God that he's called us. Thank God that he has blessed us. Paul uses the word therion, which seems to come from the word theater, meaning that he's a spectacle. He's been put on display for others to see. The enemy, especially, and the leaders of the world want the world to see that Christians are not that appealing. And so they put them on spectacle. I don't know if you've noticed it or not, but it's not culturally uh, uh, couth anymore to become a Christian or to be a Christian. It used to be something that people respected, that people looked up to. But now everybody says, oh, Christians? Mm-hmm, right, yeah, mm-hmm. There's a fine line between being thankful for what God has blessed us with, for being grateful for the things that God has given us, and being prideful and thinking that we somehow earned it on our own and thinking that somehow it's because of us that we have these things. You know, when you, when you really stop and think about it, if you are blessed with anything, it is because of God's grace and it has nothing to do with you. You're not worthy of it. You can't claim to God, God, I'm, I, I'm worthy of this. Because in reality, the only thing that has made you worthy at all is Jesus and his blood. It's not you. It's not your accomplishments. Even the Apostle Paul said, all that I have done, I have done 
by the power of Christ in me, not because I'm so special. Paul is telling us that he's hungry and thirsty. Isn't that amazing? That the leader of the church at that time, or one of the leaders of the Corinthian believers at that time, would actually be hungry and thirsty. When's the last time you've been hungry and thirsty? Oh, well, I'm not saying that, you know, being hungry and wanting something to eat, you know, while well, I'm hungry. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about where you haven't eaten for days, for weeks. And your body is starving to death. That's the kind of hunger that I'm talking about. When is the last time you actually experienced that? You know, it's so easy for us to get in the mode of, I don't like that. When in reality, the, even the apostles taught us to eat what was set before us. To not look at it and say, that's not something that I prefer. That's not my liked meal. We have to be careful that we do not become prideful about all these things. Paul goes on to say he's the filth of the world. The word he uses there is what people used to use to describe the things that they would sweep off the dock into the ocean. The garbage of the world. Things that people cast off and was not important anymore. Paul said that's what we are. We're the filth of the world. It's a little embarrassing when we Think about all the technology that we have. The computers, the cell phones, and all these blessings from God. And yet the apostles barely had enough food to eat. We're surrounded by computers, books, Google. All the abilities of modern world. We need to be careful that we do not become prideful of that. There are scenarios in the survivalist books that talk about the day we all wake up in the internet and all the electricity and all the things are gone. What would people do? How would you survive? Isn't it a shame that we'd have to be taught how to survive? It's because we become so dependent and so prideful on all these other things that we, losing them, would not know what to do. Just look at Paul. He's bounced from church to church, run out of many towns, accused of starting riots, rarely supported in the ministry. He has to work to take care of himself. He's arrested, imprisoned. Who would want Paul to be their pastor today? You see, I remember the first time that I ever met. You know, I was there was a time when I was naive, and I remember the first time I ever met uh, a pastor who was a doctor. We spoke for a few minutes, and I asked him, you know, what was the deal? And he said, well, you know, in our denomination, if you want to be somebody, you have to become a doctor because if, if you're not a doctor, the, the bigger churches won't even hire you. What an indictment. What an indictment of God's people that we would say, hey, I've got to have a doctor to be my pastor or we don't want him. You see, that's judging by the world's standards and not God's. We should always be careful that our pastor is somebody that's, that's aligned with God's word more so than he is aligned with the accepted theology of the day. With the society's viewpoint of God and Christianity. The two are so much different. The way the world thinks that we should be as Christians and what God's word tells us are not the same. Lord, give us ministers who speak the word of God and not be afraid of the consequences and be willing to endure whatever suffering that might come their way. Oh, pastor, I'm going to stop paying my tithes. Go ahead. 
It's not the pastor, it's you. Paul gives him a final warning and that's where I want to end. Apparently, he had heard and gotten word that some people didn't want to hear from him anymore. They didn't think he was their leader and therefore they could ignore him. And so he writes to them and says in verse 14, I don't write these things to shame you, but as my children, I warn you. Wow. Warn you. For though you might have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I have begotten you through the gospel. Therefore, I urge you to imitate me. For this reason, I have sent Timothy to you, who is my beloved and faithful son in the Lord, who will remind you of the ways of Christ as I teach it in every church. In other words, Timothy's coming to, he's coming to check it out to make sure you're still in the gospel. And Paul is appealing to you as a father, saying, you know, I'm your father. I brought you into the kingdom. So I deserve special respect, a, a special place of authority in your life. He ends in verse 18 with a question. Now some are puffed up as though I were not coming to you, but I will come to you shortly. Isn't it amazing people would say, well, Paul hadn't been here in a while and not considering that he might not have the money, not considering that he might not have the funds, just thinking that, hey, if we were all that important to Paul, he'd come see us. Yes, but maybe there's another reason he's not able to come right now. But he reminds them, I'm coming. If the Lord wills it, and, and I will, no. Not the words of these who are puffed up, but the power. For the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. What do you want? Shall I come to you with a rod of, or with love and a spirit of gentleness? I don't think Paul is threatening them. I think he's reminding them that he can spank them if he, if he wanted to, but that he'd rather and desire to just hug them and just love them. And so he's asking them to repent of their ways, repent of their puffed up, repent of their thinking, repent of it and get back in the proper relationship, not only with God, but with those who are in authority over you. You know, many people tell me when I talk to them about God and about church and about, I don't need the church. I can serve God without the church. I don't need a pastor. I can serve God without a pastor. Let me tell you something. There's a fine line between being free and all of us desire being free. And there's a fine line between being free and being in right relationship with God. And I believe you can be free and be in the right relationship with God, but you cannot do that if you ignore God's principles. And one of the principles that God has established is he has established leaders within the church. And so it's important for us to stay connected, and it's important for us to stay in good relationship with those that are in authority over us. And we should never want them to come with us to us with a rod. We should never desire that they would discipline us. We should always desire that they would come to us with a good spirit, a kind heart, a lovingness, because they care about us, because they want the best for us. So here we are at Pastor's Appreciation Month. Make sure you tell your pastors you love them. Make sure you show appreciation. There will be many people this next few weeks that are in the ministry who will say, I'm done. I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm going to find another way to earn a living. I'm going to find another way to take care of my family. I, this is an unappreciated job. I'm not going to do it anymore. You and I have the ability to make sure that they keep in the kingdom and that they keep answering the call and that they keep showing up 
You and I have that ability. You might say, well, <clears throat> I have a pastor. That's good. I'm glad. You should, you should be appreciative of your pastor. But remember this, the kingdom of God is made of many leaders. So be thankful for all of those who continue in the work. Just a few days ago, we watched as one of our national leaders, Reverend Billy Graham, brought everyone together to pray. I don't know about you, but I appreciate that. I appreciate the efforts. I appreciate the hard work of bringing him, all those people together, plus all those that helped him. I've even sent out messages of great gratefulness, and I'm going to make sure that I send an offering because I want to be thankful to those who are doing the hard work the hard lifting to keep us in the right relationship with God. Would you pray with me, Lord? We thank you for the Apostle Paul and his words. May we be shocked out of our pridefulness. May we reestablish ourselves, Lord Jesus, in right relationship not only with you, but with our authorities and with all those in the kingdom, our brothers and sisters, may we do what we're supposed to do, Lord, and be careful of that pride that tries to creep into our lives. Help us, Lord Jesus, to keep that Christ-like spirit always in us and flowing through us. In Jesus' name. Would you go ahead now and get your elements together? We want to thank God for the sacrifice that he gave for us. We remember that it costs something for you and me. It costs something for us to be healed of a spiritual death, to be healed of a fallen life. It costs something. And what it costs was our Lord. He gave himself for us. Lord, we think now and remember the blessed sacrifice, Lord Jesus. The giving of your body. We receive it. We thank, we're great, grateful for it, Lord. The pouring out of your blood. Lord, that heals our sin-sick soul. Lord, today we remember you and we are grateful to you. Thank you, Lord, for the atonement. Thank you for the sacrifice. As we enter into this special time of the year, Lord, may we continue, Lord, to be aligned with you, to be filled with your presence, in Jesus' name. Take your bread, your juice. Receive it now in Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. Because of our Lord's sacrifice, peace has been given to us Peace between us and the Father. Peace between us and all men. I pray that you will now go in peace, that you will live in peace, and that you will give peace to all. Have a good week. Join us again Wednesday at 7. God bless you. We love you. Take care.